a good morning to you. I hope that you are doing fine. I am well and welcome to our class this day. Uh, today we're doing our first topic. Uh, and I do believe that as we engage in the first topic of this course, occupational health and safety, you've been able to go through the previous audios that I posted on, a, on the introductory part of the unit whereby we have the overview of this course. And I do hope that you've been able to engage and you've been able to make maybe a summary of the same. Uh, but more so in today's class, it's more about the introduction <laughs> whereby we need to to do the introduction of occupational health and safety. Uh, as an introduction to this topic, we have it that um, this introduction provides you with general background information on occupational health and safety and on the magnitude and variety of health and safety problems worldwide and explains the role of health and safety representatives. Remember, issues to do with occupational health and safety is not just a matter of um, employers only. It's also a matter of the employees and the uh, employers and other people who could be concerned, you know, people who are interested in a certain workplace. Basically, it's more about workplace activities and the, 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 its safety. And uh, the objectives of this topic are that by the end of this lesson, you as a learner, you should be able to define occupational health, explain the scope of occupational health and safety, discuss principles of occupational health and safety, uh, identify the elements of a workplace environment, and also discuss the importance of occupational health and safety. So with this, we shall break it down. We shall today just introduce and with the principles and aims, uh, we could focus more about them in our next class. Uh, so today we'll, we'll do basically the introduction on, in terms of definition and um, just knowing the interdisciplinary relationships that are there within occupational health and safety. So within this course, uh, we do have the, um, some activities that are posted for you in this topic whereby you need to do some discussion, some quizzes, so that uh, you are able to acquaint yourself with what we are doing. And in case you have any question, you're free to ask in our live class that will begin at noon. Now, what is occupational health and safety? I know you've ever heard of this term. What comes to your mind when you hear about occupational health and safety? Basically, it's a discipline with a broad scope involving many specialized fields in its broadest sense, and it will aim at one, the promotion and maintenance of the highest degree of physical, mental, and social well-being of workers in all occupations. So, as in, what you're saying is that in, in terms of its definition, it's a discipline with a very broad scope, and it has many fields. It has many specialized fields, of which usually it's aimed at several aspects of which we are breaking them down. So the definition seems a bit broad in itself, but maybe let's go step by step and we shall learn more. So we we'll say that in that broad sense, it's, it should aim at the promotion and maintenance of the highest degree of physical, mental, and social well-being of workers in all occupations. Like um, it should help uh, promote or maintain the physical uh, state of the, the the occupants of a given place, the workers in all occupations, like um, in terms of physical injuries, like falls, you know, cuts, bruises, you know, uh, those major accidents that can um, are quite be detrimental in terms of mental. Let someone work while settled. Someone work while feeling at peace, enjoying. We shall have a topic on ergonomics whereby it talks about the sitting postures, you know, the equipment that people use, uh, the furniture, you know. So mentally and even socially, people should be able to have a space where they could be able to socialize with one another, uh, talk, you know, have a light moment with each other, talk about issues, the pressures of life, the pressures at work, and see how they can cope. Another aim um, of um, 
occupational health is in terms of prevention among workers of adverse effects on health caused by their working conditions. Adverse effects, the people who work in like companies, um, manufacturing companies, industries, whereby you find that there are uh, chemicals that are emitted that are quite poisonous. So in such, it could cause an adverse effect to the health of that those individuals working there. So it's important for the employer so the the owners of such premises such industries to put in place uh ways of prevention among us the workers of adverse effects because there are those who can inhale maybe like asbestos or those um uh, dangerous gases and it can be detrimental to their lungs or to their heart you know yet their respiratory system basically uh it also aims at the protection of workers in the employment from risks resulting from factors adverse to health. Um, that those factors, risk factors that could uh, worsen health conditions of the workers, or it could bring about such. So, uh, occupational health and safety basically focuses on that to ensure that to to ensure that all the workers are protected from the risks resulting from factors that could cause adverse effects to health. Then the placing and maintenance of workers in an occupational environment adapted to physical and mental needs. Uh, here we have it that it's important to know that uh, workers have a right to, to to have their mental needs met and also their physical needs in terms of being physically safe. So it aims at the placing and maintenance of workers in an occupational environment adapted to physical and mental needs. So they need to adapt to the situations in this place and be okay so that it doesn't make them mentally ill. Then lastly, the adaptation of work to him. In other words, occupational health and safety just encompasses the social, mental, and physical well-being of workers. That is the whole person. Um, We have it that successful occupational health and safety practice requires the collaboration and participation of both employees and workers in health and safety programs and involves the consideration of issues relating to occupational medicine, industrial hygiene, toxicology, education, engineering, safety, economic psychology, etc. So I think that for a successful occupational health safety practice, it will require the collaboration of many other sectors. And that is what we're talking about, the interdisciplinary relationships, because in our topic today, as we cover the introductory part of occupational health and safety, we are basically basing on the definition of some terms and also interdisciplinary relationships. So you'll find that because it's something that encompasses the whole person, it will cut across the uh, medicine field, industrial hygiene, toxicology, education, engineering, safety, economics, and also psychology. So that we take care of the physical, the mental, of this individual, so that the person is whole, even as he or she works at that given workplace. Occupational health issues are often given less attention than occupational safety. So what is the difference in the way between occupational safety and occupational health? <laughs> what could be the difference? Think through. You'll share with me in our live class. We'll be engaging live. Uh, so we have it that occupational health issues often give less attention. Issues to do with the health of the workplace are given less attention compared to those on occupational safety. Like just ensuring that there are fire extinguishers in place, that the floors are okay, they are not slippery, ensuring there's uh, enough water for hand washing when people go to the toilet or, uh, yeah. Uh, because I think the former are generally, that is occupational health, are generally more difficult to confront. Remember, some people have the, their own health issues even as they join different workstations. So, Sometimes it's difficult to confront and to narrow down. However, when health is addressed, so is safety. Because a healthy workplace is, by definition, also a safe workplace. So a healthy workplace is the same as safe workplace. So safety and health should actually go hand in hand. That is what I'm trying to say. When a healthy, health has been observed so that 
the place is healthy in terms of hygiene, in terms of sanitation, in terms of taking care of the furniture that people use that are friendly to the body, they're not straining the back, they're not straining the eyes or the arms, you know, so that they can bring about other deformities, then we'll say this place is actually safe. Yeah, and the converse may not be true. So uh, the so-called safe workplace is not necessarily also a healthy workplace. It could be safe, yes, if taken care of the safety measures in terms of ensuring there is a fire extinguisher. But there may never be a fire breakout in this place, maybe for the next 100 years. So if you've worked there for like 20 years, yes, there are fire extinguishers. You've never used them or rather than not. There are key years. There could be plastic kits, yes. But then what about the floors? Probably they have not been taken care of in terms of um, of being in uh, with standards that are have been recommended so that they're not too slippery. Uh, what about uh, offs? You know, the off times, the, 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 the leave periods that have been scheduled or rather that are given. Are there off days that are given to these workers so that they can mentally cool off, they can go and unwind, they can go and refresh, you know? Are there provisions for such or is it that these workers work from day one of the year to the day 365 of the year? As in, um, there are other provisions. It could be safe, but it may not be healthy because probably there are so many other issues that could be causing psychological traumas to the to specific individuals or to the workers in this place. So we would say that actually it's not the same. So a safe workplace is not necessarily healthy. Are we together? Yes. All right. The important point here is that issues of both health and safety must be addressed in every workplace. By and large, the definition of occupational health and safety given above encompasses both health and safety in the broadest contexts. So in summary, I'm just saying that when you talk about occupational health and safety, they all go hand in hand. They can never be separated. And we are saying that uh, a safe workplace is not necessarily a healthy workplace, but a healthy workplace is actually very safe. It's a safe workplace for the workers who work in that given place. Maybe you can look at uh, poor working conditions and how they affect the worker health safety. If you have poor working conditions at the workplace, how would they affect the productivity of the workers? How would they affect maybe the health of the workers? How would they affect the output of these workers or their general lives? Maybe we can go through this and see how it would. Uh, firstly, poor working conditions of any type have the potential to affect a worker's health and safety. Poor working conditions of any type have the potential to affect a worker's health and safety. Uh, and by this, please think through what poor working conditions mean to you. And when we engage in a live class, you should be able to let me know what came to your mind when you heard about this word, poor working conditions. What does it mean to you? Uh, and you're saying that of such, of any type, they have the potential to affect a worker's health and safety. They have that ability to affect the worker's health and safety. Also, poor working conditions of uh, unhealthy, sorry, unhealthy or unsafe working conditions are not limited to factories. They can be found anywhere, whether the workplace is indoors or outdoors. And for many workers, such as agricultural workers or miners, the workplace is outdoors and can pose many health and safety hazards. We've heard of those people who are miners, those who go to mine, Maybe they want to get those precious metals like gold. And uh, as they do the mining, the mine, the mine hills, you come uh, tumbling on them and they are covered in those tunnels. They are covered in the ground while they were doing the mining. Those who also do the farming, like the, the farm, mostly their work is outdoor. They're there in the field, they're there in the sun. And sometimes they're using chemicals to spray these flowers so that, that they don't go bad. Uh, so even with that, 
it can pose a health and safety hazard to them. Uh, so it tells us that uh, if there are poor working conditions, whether indoor or outdoor, those unhealthy conditions can affect people. So when you talk about unhealthy and unsafe working conditions, we're not just limited to factories or companies. We're not limited to manufacturing plants. We are also talking about those outdoor activities that people engage in. The Django people, you know, construction, road construction. We've heard of people who construct and then maybe tractors end up um, are running on them. As they run on them, they die. You know, what happens to those families of the loved ones who go through that? Or you may be left with a, um, an infirmity that you live with forever. Maybe the limb may need to be amputated or something. Yeah. Then we have another point on this, that poor working conditions also affect the environment workers. Uh, environment the workers live in, since the working and living environments are the same for many workers. This means that occupational hazards can have harmful effects on workers, their families, and other people in the community as well, as or the physical environment around the workplace. A classic example is the pesticide and agricultural work. Of course, I've mentioned that. We find that if people are doing mostly this commercial farming, like the flowers, uh, what else is treated for export in Kenya? Coffee, uh huh. Yeah, so most likely there will be a lot of the spraying of these plants with some chemicals to uh, avert the pests. So by using by use of these pesticides, a uh, constant exposure to them can bring about toxicity. They can become toxic to the systems of individuals using, and they can bring about skin. Uh, problems, uh, respiratory problems, you know, they can force challenges to their eyes so that their eyes will be affected in terms of visibility and such like. So we are saying that workers can be exposed to toxic chemicals in a number of ways when spraying pesticides like health chemicals. During and after spraying, the chemicals can be absorbed through the skin and the workers can also ingest the chemicals if they eat, drink or smoke without first washing their hands or if drinking water has become contaminated with the chemicals. So the workers' families um, can also be exposed in a number of ways. They can inhale the pesticides, which may linger in the air. They can drink also con contaminated water, or they can be exposed to residues, which may be on the other workers' clothes. So other people in the community can be exposed in the same ways as well. And when the chemicals get absorbed into the soil or leach into the groundwater supply, the adverse effects on the natural environment can be permanent. Now, I think this one would make you be interested in being more rich about how factories dispose their waste products. You'll find that they're supposed to have a water body around where they have channels from their factories that um, dispose liquid uh, chemicals into that given body. But you find that quite a number in Kenya. I'm not sure, but maybe it's something for both of us to research on. Um, they do dispose their waste product in rivers. So are the people who use the water in the rivers, it's the common one. It is you and I, it's our communities that use this water. So as you go fetch that water and it's full of chemicals, so it will happen. You go, even if you warm it or boil it, as we usually say, you need to boil drinking water. You'll boil it, but then at the end of the day, as you intake, you have chemicals that have been <laughs> heated. So even double tragedy, it's not safe for us at all, at all. So what you're saying is that as an individual, an individual may be affected, assuming with the issue of pesticides or even the company. Then after inhaling or having it on the skin and having skin infections and diseases, or, or ingesting it through eating or drinking or even smoking, then passes it on to the family members in the same way, maybe by drinking contaminated water or exposing the clothes that have residues of these chemicals to the other family members. They touch them, they inhale also. It will still pass to the community. And if any of these wastes go into the soil, we call it leaching, they go deep into the soil, they're likely to go down and go to the and after it gets there, you'll find that it will be now an environmental hazard and it will be even more detrimental to the entire community, will have put the entire community at risk. Do you see the sense in this? 
So working conditions are very crucial. And these all touch on occupational health and safety. So overall efforts in occupational health and safety must aim to prevent industrial accidents and diseases and at the same time recognize the connection between worker health and safety, the workplace, and the environmental fit of the workplace. Maybe briefly we could again look at the occupational health and safety importance. Why do you think occupational health and safety is important? Why would we take time and learn uh, this as a course uh, specifically, like why are we interested in occupational health and safety? You find that work plays a central role in people's lives since most of us spend at least eight hours a day in the workplace, whether it is a, on a plantation, in a factory, in a school, you know, therefore, work environment should be safe and healthy. Yet, this is not the case for many workers. Every day, we find that workers all over the world are faced with a multitude of health hazards. And uh, could you think of examples? Where do you work yourself? Yeah, I know one of us works in a hospital setup. So remember, as you work in the hospital, we're exposed to the hazards, you know, the infectious uh, uh, waste that have been disposed by the patients, you know, that others that seem non infectious, but they could be infectious, you know. As you engage with them, you know, assuming that you have a patient who has TB, you know, TB is an airborne disease, so as you keep interacting, you, you could be infected in one or another, you know. Uh, sometimes, yes, we could call them workplace accident. I have a friend uh, who works in a health facility, and uh, one time she was handling a TB patient. Then later on, she realized that she has the same symptoms. On uh, getting tested, she was actually TB positive and she was so traumatized, but she took the medications faithfully and the TB cleared. That just gives us one scope. So maybe we could think of what could be the preventive measure of health works. Could it be that they need to put masks when uh, they are handling such patients who have diseases that are airborne that can easily be spread? But at the same time, if they put on masks, how will the other patients feel? Will they feel neglected? Will they feel stigmatized? You know, will they feel out of place? Will it discourage them from coming to health facilities? So I think that is a bond to chew. It's 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 something you need to think about. I have another friend also, and this one uh, is a is a doctor. He's a gynecologist, and um, at some point, one time he was handling a HIV positive woman who was pregnant. So he walked with her through the journey of pregnancy and it came time for delivery and it happened that this woman needed a CS. she was actually scheduled for CS, elective CS. Now when this time came for her to get to the theater this doctor was uh, busy operating on her. then at some point he doesn't even know what happened somehow one of the gadgets he was using the knife uh, cut him and he bled now he wanted whether to stop operating on this woman. The woman <laughs> is unconscious on the operating table. Uh, the baby has just come out. You need to sew back uh, the, 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 the organs, you know, and help this woman be in shape and be wheeled back to the resting place and then back to the ward. And he was so devastated, but he just braved up, finished up the surgery, and then it was so traumatizing for him. He couldn't do any other surgery in the in the coming future. So what he did, because of the trauma, other doctors had to come in to counsel him. Other counselors within the, the hospital had to come in and counsel him, and he was given the uh, prophylaxis, that is the ARVs, for him to take uh, so that he's not exposed. He had to do PEP, the pre, pre exposure prophylaxis drugs, and he took for a whole month and eventually he did another test and he turned out to be negative until now he's negative what does that tell us every workplace has its own uh, challenges and exposures in terms of safety and health so we just need to be on the lookout and if it happens what next is there a measure for example now maybe in the scenario of this kind of scenario, the first one didn't show with me to cancel or 
anything just to pressurize you to think. On this other case, at least for support, there was support to try to give you support. So that the department had the psychological or psychosocial support so that he was scandaled, he was encouraged, and eventually he was able to walk the journey. Now, uh, in terms of the plantations, you know, people who work in plantation farms, sometimes you hear about women who are harassed by the men, they are sexually abused. So, is that really safe for them? Uh, assuming that they are having a protected sex, is it safe for them? They're likely to contract like STDs, uh, the STIs, including HIV, AIDS. Uh, so, that means they're not so safe, you know. And um, sometimes if it's a boss or a supervisor, uh, there is harassing that is given a, a lady. Most ladies are the ones that are harassed. How will she cope because she needs this little money for the upkeep of the family? How will she cope to ensure that her children go to school, that her young one is able to get some uh, food to eat? So as she struggles to get food, food on the table, she's also putting her life at risk. Are there measures that have been put in place? Are there policies in place, like the sexual harassment policies? Are they, are they in place in such, uh, in such organizations or in such places? Of, in factories, in offices, we hear so much that keeps happening. We have workplace uh, policies, uh, like the sexual harassment policy. You have, you know, the ethical policies and such, like, we need to do have the disciplinary policies in case one is found doing one, two, three. What are the measures put in place? What are the consequences of such actions? If they're put in place, then you'll find that this issue will take care of both health and safety of individuals. Are we together? Yeah, so that tells us that occupational health and safety is so important. And with this knowledge, you'll find that employers are able to take care of their workers. Workers are able to enjoy the, the, the working at the, their specific workplaces that are designated to work. They enjoy work, they will be productive, they will be effective, they will be efficient in all they do. Yeah, yeah. So the work environment to be safe and healthy. It's very crucial. Do you agree with me? Uh -huh. Okay, so we are saying that yet this is not the case for many workers. Just as I've given this example, it's not the case. It should be, but it's not the case, sadly. So employers need to tile up. Uh, they need to tile up. The CEOs need, need to tile up. The directors of these given workplaces, they need to tile up. Is it? Yeah. So everyday workers all over the world are faced with a multitude of health hazards. So daily as you go to the workplace or people go to the workplaces, they're exposed to so many hazards and one of them is dust. Remember, if you are exposed to dust, maybe you go into the place, the walls are dusty, the tables are dusty, the floor is dusty, you know, the whole environment is just dusty, the files are so dusty in the office. You're likely to inhale this dust and with that as it accumulates within your lungs. As you inhale it, it is likely to bring to you respiratory challenges, lung-related issues, the cancers are here with us, you know, so it predisposes us to diseases. Gases, poisonous gases that are, are eliminated uh, from the factories. As we inhale them, they're likely to bring about respiratory problems in our lungs and the entire respiratory system, and it can easily break down. So once it's broken, broken down and maybe there's accumulation of water in the lungs. What happens? It, yes, it will be drained, but usually when there's water within the lungs, it's likely to make some other organs start uh, rotting, you know, they, they start, uh, they, they have to undergo, you know, operations, they have to, there, there are many, like the, the bills, medical bills start going up, you know, the medical attention uh, in terms of even spending time in hospital, time is spent more on that uh, rather than taking care of the work and do more productive. It's also the aspect of noise. Look at people who live along the roads or they work in factories where there's a lot of noise. At this time back, I visited a factory where forays are being made. You find that this place is so noisy because you know there's a metal. So, you know, the machines are uh, uh, roaring, and here we have others that are producing this fruit, just shaping them. You know, there are those people who are manually now shaping them with a something to make them you know, be around and share. It's so noisy. So, if 
Just work in such an environment. By the time you go back home, I think you'll just be hearing that noise in your ears. Because it's, it's like it's been engraved within you. How do you cope with that? Do, have they been given the yeah, yeah, aids, the ones that help in terms of sound? I'll show you me next, uh, next week in the video that I'll post. Uh, I have some hearing aid that I once visited a certain company that produces um, um, this sugary stuff, the, the, the pepper that comes from the sugar. There's a time we visited some time back when I was in campus, many years back, and all of us were given the hearing aid so that that noise doesn't affect our eardrums, our ears. So those people who work in such places, they can start having hearing problems. And with that, you know, that is a problem that has been created from a workplace and it could be avoided is it do you agree with me yeah then there's also vibration of course again vibration and noise almost go hand in hand uh but maybe with the vibration think of those people who work on the road huh Th those construction workers who use those big trucks that uh, that have round i don't know if you call them wheels or uh, those metallic things that keep uh, uh, pressing on on the road, especially on the tarmac road, so that it can be able to be smooth enough, it can be able to be strong. It makes the tar and the and and the motor to to stick together. Uh, yeah. With that, if you have worked with this engine for such a long time, like an entire day, uh, entire week, then entire month, then entire year. What, are, what about your hearing aids? What about the other systems, systems in your body? It may bring about other detrimental effects that you can research about and see how uh, it could affect individuals. Mm, then we have extreme temperatures. We have places where uh, whatever is being produced in this company needs extremely high temperatures. So people working in such places need to be protected because, again, our bodies have a normal temperature that they need to cope with. What is that temperature? The one that we call room temperature? How many degrees Celsius? I should know you. Yeah, I should know you. Um, so if the temperature is quite extreme, they can alter how the body functions because the way which the body should function under the to normal temperature. So that you find that even if your temperature goes beyond 37, 38, 39, 40, you're likely to be admitted because the temperatures are so high and they need to be managed. So people who work in such places are quite exposed to some dangers in terms of in their own skin. Uh, they could get eventually skin cancers that could be an, a problem to deal with. So unfortunately, some employers assume little responsibility for the protection of workers' health and safety. In fact, some employers do not even know that they have the moral and uh, often uh, legal responsibility to protect their workers. And as a result, the hazards and a lack of attention given to health and safety, work-related accidents and diseases are common in all parts of the world. What does this tell us? Much as these employers uh, not even know that they have the moral and often legal responsibility, I think even the workers themselves don't know. Employees, they don't know about these legal uh, issues because people will just suffer and then they're like, really quite fragile, you know, it's like, it's okay, it's understandable, but you see, it's you who is suffering at the end of the day. If the high medical bills, it's you who has to deal with them. If there are any emotional related issues, it's you and your family that has to battle with that. You know, it is you. So none of them, very rarely will we find them going to courts of law to report such matters because that is really detrimental. You are entitled to safety wherever you work. Okay? Yes, you are. You are entitled to safety. So we need to style up. We need to educate people. That is where we are learning this on the importance of occupational safety and healthy. Um, I'll, I'll briefly talk about the costs of occupational injury and disease. Now that we say that it's an issue that is likely to occur at the workplace, and because workers even don't know about their own rights, about what is expected to be done to them, they just say, yeah, it's okay, it was an accident, it's understandable, uh, it's Aisha too, you know, it will just pass, eventually we keep suffering. And as you go, maybe that worker will die, another one will replace him or her, and the same problem will recur. So we need to 
stop this cycle, we need to stop this madness, we need to stop these issues by styling up and educating our fellow workers and other people. So how much does an occupational disease or accident cost? How much? I think it will just depend um, with the nature of injury. But you see there are so many areas. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a hotel setup whereby we have some fire equipment around, we have some uh, metallic equipment around, and then there's someone who left peels of bananas on the floor and the other workers uh, uh, slid and fell. What is likely to happen? Maybe he or she could knock his head on the metallic substance uh, or uh, uh, items or on heat. The, the sulfurias, their big sulfurias or big cooking pots, you know. Uh, or the, the fall could just be on the floor. You know, if the head hits the floor, what happens? There'll be a head injury. There could be a spinal cord injury, you know. What about sweat flows or flows that uh, have not met the standards? Uh, that have been set up, you know, because the floors don't, are not supposed to be slippery. They're supposed to be moderate, whereby when one is walking, it's not easily slide. So how much will that cost? For that person who has inhaled that chemical, how much will that cost after it has accumulated in the lungs and this person needs hospitalization, needs on and off medication uh, that maybe could be a lifetime or uh, for several months before the thing clears, how much? So work-related accidents or diseases are very costly and can have many serious direct and indirect effects on the lives of the workers and their families. So for workers, some of the direct costs of an injury or illness are one, the pain and suffering of the injury or illness. Imagine today you woke up walking, then you go to that given workplace by lunchtime or by evening, you you broken your arm, you know. Or you you had a fall and uh, you can no longer see anything. You can you can never support your family again because you are in coma because you had severe brain injury. What about there's another story that we had whereby was it an oil company or something? I can't remember, but there was an equipment that was used for boiling. So uh, one work went and opened the tap without realizing the, there was another worker on the other end who was monitoring. So this other car was drowned in the hot liquid and eventually he died on the spot. So look at the trauma that comes to the family. You know, if if it's yourself and you find yourself, today you are walking and tomorrow you're on a wheelchair or you have to use crutches. Uh, how How is that, you know? Yes, it was an accident, but probably it is something that could have been averted. So you're saying that we have both direct and indirect costs that will come to the individual. And one of them, we're saying it's the pain and suffering of the injury or illness. And also there's the loss of income. Because now if you're in hospital, if you're bedridden, you're not working. So how will you uh, help your family get income for the day-to-day -day running of this family, for the daily need of this family, for the resources that are needed? it becomes now very difficult. And uh, so for the loss of income, you'll find that if this person was the breadwinner, now the family struggles day in, day out. And there's also possible loss of a job. Um, I had a relative who was working in the Air Force and uh, one time he, he had worked there for many years, for over 20 years. Then one time he just de started developing speech problems. He couldn't understand what was happening uh, to him. So when the situation was in the beat, he could not speak as much, he could stammer more. It started making him feel very inferior among his, uh, his fellow workers when he goes to work. He tried really to keep going to work on a daily basis as usual because they could go fly the airplanes in the air test, uh, do the fuel. Static. Remember, uh, the fuel for aeroplanes is highly, highly processed, and um, I think it's highly. It has a lot of lead and some other chemicals. Uh, so what happened is that he tried. Then at some point, he just got overwhelmed. What he did, he resigned his job, and they resorted him back to the, to the, um, to the native homeland. So upon going there, the family had uh, family relocated from town. Uh, they were staying here in Nairobi. They had to relocate the children 
uh, were a bit devastated, but somehow coped and they stayed back in Nairobi, different places, others are working in some places. The younger ones were still in school. So they go home and you know, now starting life anew. You don't know where to begin. Your health has deteriorated so much. You can't speak, people can't understand you. You're just a And everything changed at once and he couldn't understand what was happening. Because even while they were in Nairobi, they tried to check out for medication in different places, but he couldn't get help. Now, nothing was seen like the doctors could say, we can't see any problem in your body. Every organ is okay. Now, eventually when while in their native place, they, they came, they, they, they reached out to another doctor who did some specific several tests. They eventually found out that he was affected by lead. This lead, where did it come from? From the fuel that was being put in these planes. So that means that was actually a workplace accident that cost him his job. He lost his job. He resigned. He left and started life anew that brought about pain and suffering in terms of trauma, you know. Ah, and that is life, you see. And as we are saying, like him, I've never heard if he's sued <laughs> the Air Force or something. He, he let go. But remember, you said we have rights. We need to be because if this actually confirms that that is where the issue came from, then by now, he should have even sued them. But anyway, I'm not asking him to sue. Yeah, so we have the small loss of action. And this also healthcare costs in terms of treatment like him. They really had to spend a lot of money. They had to borrow from friends, from other relatives, because the, the, the test was so expensive until eventually now he got to know what the problem is. So I would say we have direct and indirect costs. So it has been estimated that the indirect cost of an accident or illness can be four to ten times greater than the direct cost or even more. So an occupational illness or accident can have so many indirect costs to workers that it is often difficult to measure them. One of the most obvious indirect costs in the human suffering costs to work as families which cannot be compensated with money. And basically that is the extreme trauma that comes with these people and they're left to suffer and, and, and struggle all alone. So the cost to employers of occupational disease or illnesses are also estimated to be enormous. For a small business, the cost of even one accident can be a financial disaster for employers. Some of the direct costs are payment for work not performed, you know, because this has been employee. If he or she gets an accident from the workplace and is hospitalized maybe for a whole year, you have to keep paying him because it wasn't his fault. It was a workplace accident. So payment for work not Form. He's not performing any work at your workplace, but you have to pay or him or her. Then compensation payments, sometimes because of now what you say, the rights and what is happening, sometimes there has to be compensation so that you pay this person for the losses that you brought to him or her and the medical expenses. That those companies or factories that's good enough, those workplaces that they take care of the medical bills of their employees, then repair replacement of damaged machinery and equipment. Assume there was a fire breakout because of um, some laxity of someone or some something that happened that was accidental, yes, but that may, maybe could, it, could have been avoided. So you have to have a lot of repair of those things that have been damaged in machinery and also equipment that could be very, very costly. Then reduction of a temporary halt in production. Assuming again a fire breakout or something, then it means you'll have to stop that uh, company for a while, that factory for a while, or if it's a workplace, it has to be closed down for a while. If it's school, if it's uh, at the university, if it's uh, uh, offices, you know, they have to be temporarily halted in terms of production. Then increased training expenses, the administration costs that they also possible because you have to maybe employ others, new, new, new workers who have to be trained, who have to be helped to know what this company stands for, you know, in terms of its objectives, rather aims, the core values and such like then possible reduction in the quality of work and also negative effect on morale in the other workers. In terms of the direct costs, in terms of the direct costs, uh, we find that some of the employers could be injured or the ill worker have to be replaced. 
and then a new worker has to be trained and given time to adjust. It takes time again before the new worker is producing at the rate of the new worker. Time must be devoted to obligatory investigations, to the writing of reports and filling out of forms, like to explain what really happened. Then accidents often arouse uh, the concern of the worker and influence labor relations in a negative way. And lastly, uh, an indirect cause is that poor health and safety conditions in the workplace cannot result in poor public relations. So overall, the cost of most work-related accidents or even the illnesses to workers and their families and to employers are very, very high. So in a nutshell, uh, it's important for us to know much more about this. We shall look at the next topic in our next lesson. Uh, still in topic one, it's a bit broad in itself, but the information there is covered in our second topic notes that are present there. We shall continue with it next time. But basically, today we are trying to look at the issue to do with worker safety. Introducing this course, we've looked at some few definition of terms in terms of occupational health and also safety. We're going to differentiate the two. We've tried to look at some of the accidents that will occur at workplaces and modes in which they can happen, like through dust, through the noise, gases, vibrations. Uh, we've looked at the effects of poor working conditions to the workers and even maybe to the employers. So I want to hope that we shall engage more in our next class. For now, have a nice time until we meet again. Thank you.